friends there, it just so happened that the day I landed was the same day that the Air Force Two, the plane carrying the Vice President, also landed at the Helsinki Airport on its way to Estonia to meet with the President Obama and the Estonians. This, of course, made national news and, and so everybody knew about it and, and for, for a week that I was there, the good joke about, the joke was always about the size of my luggage being so big that the Air Force Two had to deploy for The other news, a daily topic of conversation, no matter where I went or who I met in Finland, was the terrorist organization, organization ISIS. Of course, they talked about Ukraine too, but ISIS really made big news too, and, and partly because in the past decades, Finland had allowed in tens of thousands of Somali refugees, and, and now quite a, quite a few of the teenage children of these Somalis have joined the ISIS and even have become ISIS spokespeople, spokespeople in the, in, uh, online, uh, online uh, on social media for the organization. This is such an abomination and outrage to Finns as, as their refugee and settlement programs are the most generous in the world and now this is the kind of thanks and result they receive from the Somalis for their goodwill and charity. What goes wrong, they wonder, when these young people who have been given resource for a good life feel so alienated and outside that they, they choose to join a terrorist organization like ISIS and, and sacrifice their life for their service. The hired laborers of our gospel reading were the outsiders in the setting our gospel reading took place. They were not unlike what we call the day laborers we see at some street corners in our community. They too stood all day there till 5 or 6 p.m. waiting for work, as I have seen the day laborers do late in the afternoon. This is how desperately these um, workers needed work. Hired laborers were the lowest class in Palestine, and the Palestine society, even, even below slaves and servants, who were attached to a household and thus were kind of protected and safe and were never in imminent danger of starvation, which was the constant danger to the hired laborers and their families. The scene of the landlord or the hiring laborers for this vineyard is not as far-fetched as in ancient Palestine as, as a modern person we might think. It describes a kind of scene that actually happened at least once a year. The grape, har the grape harvest ripened at the end of September and was followed by rains that came. It was a matter of great urgency that the grapes were harvested quickly so that rains will not spoil this harvest. Any worker who would come at any time of the day to work, their help was wanted and welcome. It will be conceivable, therefore, that the scene this is described here will have taken place at, at that time. As the many workers arrived during the day different times to work, the owner of the vineyard might not easily know who worked how many hours. And even there, therefore, the wage he paid almost had to be the same for everyone. In preparing for this message and reading various commentaries and commentators, I was surprised to find that this parable is the least liked of all Bible parables by many people, and by preachers particularly, as they cannot come to, the, to terms with its un, seeming unfairness. Some people even wrote how, how they wished this parable wasn't even a Bible at all. That's how difficult they found its message to accept and preach on. And it will be so. If one understands this as a lesson of economics or fairness, as this lesson, lesson obviously often is, is understood. But the lesson before us is not really about either of those topics. Even though the tone of the landowner may sound a bit harsh the way Matthew wrote it, it the parable is a 
about compassion, about generosity and grace of God. The hired laborers were the bottom caste of Palestine society. They were poor and they were despised. They were outsiders who didn't have a place in the community. Here, they were shown a great generosity and grace. The most unlikely to be treated with such regard in order to express the kind of God Jesus represents, the kind of God we are called to represent. Not a God for Israelites only or for the disciples only, but a God whose grace and generosity is for everyone, even and maybe especially for the most despised and isolated individuals of our society. For we all need to belong, to be part of family, community, the human race. We are created, in fact, we are hardwired to live together, to be part of something more and bigger than our own personal company or our family or our origin, to be transformed by something other than our humanness. We are made for life together in a larger community so that we might more fully live out the life God intends for everyone. This is not always, of course, easy, but then again, it is through the difficult, hard and hard times in our lives that we grow. Growth rarely comes without some pain. This message of community is an even more, more urgent message and call in a world in which people are so desperate to find their identity and a, a place to belong, to belong that they, they join terrorist groups like ISIS. According to the experts who research the backgrounds and psyches of the people who saw, join such extreme groups, is the need to belong, to identify with a group and ideology. Such extreme groups attract those who feel disenfranchised from the people and and society around them. This speaks then to the need for communities that are coherent and strong so that we can guide young people in directions that direct them to paths of compassion, kindness, and grace. Communities like church, of course, but schools and scouts troops and colleges and clubs, athletic teams can all be places of belonging positive belonging. In a world in which it is too easy to find identity through the social media and be attracted to groups that are not helpful, it is increasingly important to build and strengthen communities in which we provide opportunities for real interaction with one another and thus find ways to belong, to grow, and to support one another in our humanity. The compassion and grace of God remain just lofty words unless we put them in practice and become like the landowner whose generosity and graciousness has puzzled and outraged people for 2,000 years now. For to live in a community where we are shaped and challenged to become who God called us to be, we also will find joy and place to have fun. For a cheerful heart is a good medicine for any malady, and, and God desires for us to have fun, to choose to be a good cheer at all times for others' sake. One day, I was walking out of a restaurant after having lunch with a group of people from church. We were, we were chatting and very cheerful and laughing and carrying on on, on our way out of the restaurant and uh, that must have been noticed. And I would like to point out that this was not a group of teenagers. You might have thought so, but it wasn't. Um, so after I departed from the company of others, an older gentleman stopped me and asked me if it was true that blondes have, blondes have more fun. <laughs> I replied to him that, of course it is. <laughs> but that, of course, has nothing to do with the hair color. The fun, 
The joy is found in the gathering of the community, in the presence of one another. As we have been called to be together, the presence of God, the presence of God's grace and compassion to one another in this world. So together is a wonderful place 